Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, all financial advisors are not equal. Part one in our series on retirement tips for seniors with registered financial consultant and investment advisor representative, Ted Meyer. Welcome to the show, Ted, and welcome back yes, to the thank show. thank you. We were here last year and I appreciate you having me back again. Well, uh, I, I, I know that all financial advisors are not created equal. But are they, are they really, there's different people hanging their shingles out in the public domain that, that say, hey, listen, this is what I am. And there are major differences. Why don't you walk us through the kind of hierarchy of the advisory and see where we're at and see if people are really getting, especially with the Department of Labor's new law, this has taken on a whole new uh, idea. I think that what you just said there about the Department of Labor law, that's really brought it to the forefront because I think I've been in the business about 14 years now. And now more than ever, people are asking us, what's the Department of Labor doing? What's this rule about? And so they're really looking at the investment advisors as what are they, who are they, and how are they doing their business and what do they do? So really there's, there's two types of advisors out there, or maybe three. Um, a lot of people are used to the old investment advisors, the brokers, the IAs that were, we consider money gatherers, where they went out there, they gathered assets, kept them under management. And then every year they sat down and talked to you about it. And they were really interested in just gathering assets and managing them. Mm -hmm. And then now you've got 65 licenses that's out there where they're investment advisors. They're technically fiduciaries is what they're called. And so that's the big thing with the Department of Labor was, is your advisor a fiduciary or not? Is he doing what's in your best interest or is he doing what's in the best interest of the firm? Well, let me just stop you there for a second. It seems to me inherent in the morality of our business that we should be putting the client first anyways. Why do we have to have somebody come with a reg to tell us to do that? You know what? I'm not really sure. I, I'm cut from the same cloth that if you're in business, you're trying to do the best for the client. That's the best way for your business mm -hmm. to move forward. But I think what's happened in the past was everybody fed into a little suitability. Mm -hmm. They fit into a box where as long as it's the right, the client fits in this mm -hmm. box, we can sell them anything in here. And they didn't take into account things like commissions, fees, structure, mm -hmm. performance. And so the DOLs come out really from the 401k side of it saying there's a lot of money in 401ks where folks have been putting money away for a long time not understanding how these fees work. And so I think the whole mm -hmm. fee structure has really catapulted this conversation to the forefront where people are looking at it saying, what are my fees? What am I being charged? What mm -hmm. type of advisor are you? Shocker. And by the way, you can't make things like this up. You know, they had a big fidelity report that talked about the fees involved and remember, five years ago, they came up with a new reg called 408B2, which was supposed to fully disclose all admin fees, not just the mutual fund or ETF right. fee, but yep. everything all in. And I tell you what, people were shocked that the accumulation over, let's say you were 35 and you went all the way to 65, you might be six figures in fees by the time we're out that far in retirement. So people are seeing this, they object to it, and am I really getting that kind of servicing to pay out that kind of expense load? Yeah, you know what? At the end of the day, it comes down to this is your money you've been putting away. Forbes actually did a study on this uh, about three or four years ago about the actual expense loads and fees inside of mutual funds. And I think it was staggering for most folks to realize that in the retail world, most people did not realize that fees on traditional retail mutual funds, when you take in the loads and you take the SIA and the cash drag, we'll get into that in a minute, they were north of three, three and a half, sometimes over 4%, depending on the tax bill that they count from the beginning every year. So. They got their statement and the advisor would say, hey, this fund returns seven, eight, or nine, mm -hmm. but on paper, I'm looking at three, four, or five. Mm -hmm. And you start compounding that over 15, 20, 30 years inside of a 401k, mm -hmm. it's a big, big difference. Yeah, I don't mind if the guy is really putting some numbers up, but you know, nobody's really outperforming anybody else on their individual picks. Most people are still playing indexing. They like indexing. All right. I have people that are not security licensed at all. There's usually insurance. They usually can only sell long-term care, yep. uh, life insurance, fixed life insurance, and fixed annuities. People who have Series 6 could do mutual funds, could do variable products, depending Correct. upon if they're licensed on the insurance side of that. Yep. You're fully licensed. You can sell anything. You could charge a fee. We so there's all, all there's all kinds of people here. So yep. some people might have a conflict of interest if they're not fully licensed because they'll only be able to sell you what they have. So it's important for our consumers to understand, depending upon how they're licensed, this could dictate how true they are to make you the client first. That couldn't be any truer. We do a lot of retail seminars where we go out and see folks, and I can't tell you how many times folks will sit down and tell me who their advisor is. And one of the first questions I ask is, is he securities licensed, or is he insurance licensed, or is he both? What type of securities mm -hmm. license? Because once you understand how your advisor gets paid, and what side of the aisle they're on, it will mm -hmm. answer all your questions on what they do. 
So if you are just an insurance person, mm -hmm. the solution is going to be insurance only, whether you like mm -hmm. it or not. If you're a securities license, the answer is going to be some sort of securities, stocks, bonds, mutual mm -hmm. funds. But if you do both, and that's what our firm does, we feel that the best thing to do is sit down with the client, figure out what their overall mm -hmm. plan is. What are they trying to accomplish? Because the answer for that could be a, re it could be a mutual fund. It could be an ETF. It could be stocks. Mm -hmm. It could also be guaranteed income for life. It could be long-term care. And so when you sit down with them, you want to understand everything they're trying to accomplish and then be able to provide anything that they need. Okay, so do I need to kind of do a little bit of due diligence on the guy that I'm hiring as an advisor then? I mean, is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. You need to look at it and say, where is my money kept and how do they get paid? Because that will dictate 100% what they're going to do. I mean, when's the last time your investment advisor at one of the big houses here in town advised you to go down the road and take some of your money somewhere else because mm. they had a product they couldn't offer? They never do. They never do. And, and typically when... I deal with a lot of the retirement market, 55 and older, getting near retirement. We start thinking we want to get a little safer. We start looking at income. We start looking at the distribution mm -hmm. of our money instead of the accumulation of it. And so that takes into a whole new phase of life. Instead mm -hmm. of gathering assets, we're now taking income. We're distributing them. we got to make sure these things last. And so if your advisor, if your advisor is not set up to be able to handle those things for you, mm -hmm. you can get into some trouble. The, the biggest problem we see is mm -hmm. retirees in their 75, 75, 80s, mm -hmm. investing like they're 45, still working. Mm -hmm. And we've had a great bull run, but when that churns, mm -hmm. which it will, we don't know when, but it will, we want to make sure we're covered. Listen, I have to say the public at large, we have been lulled to sleep. We don't even remember what 2008 was about. I mean, that was a huge punitive loss. And Absolutely. most people didn't recover their 401k back to par until about 2015. So we want to be careful here to make sure people, do you understand your timeline? Yep. Do you understand the beta risk, the risk that you have to exposure to your principal? These are all important things. Absolutely. Um, Ted, uh, people, you know, we, we, if you're an RIA, you're charging a fee. Most people around point, point and a half to spend upon where you are at. But the actual fund has expense loads. Now, you have to declare the expense ratio on the mutual fund in the prospectus. Correct. You know, yep. the, the, the brochure has to talk about it. Yeah. But there are other expenses that are not cited in that Correct. that actually come out of the client's pocket. And what bothers me is it doesn't, I don't understand the SEC on this, it's not it doesn't have to be disclosed to the client. It does not have to be disclosed. Correct. It's What's in something that? called the Statement of Additional Information. I don't know. I think when you go on most products that are, you know, financial products you're purchasing out there, whether they be insurance or securities, for the most part, they'll disclose things. But when it comes to things like mutual funds, this is what we're talking about right now. There's the, the fund fee that's disclosed up front. Everyone knows what it is. It ranges anywhere from 10 basis points, one-tenth of 1%, to maybe as high as 1.5%. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's up front. But there's other things out there. Statement of additional information, the marketing costs, the fund mm -hmm. manager's fees. There's things like cash. How much? When I invest in a mutual fund, I want to invest. I want to be fully invested into whatever mm -hmm. they're trying to do. There's sometimes some cash on the side waiting mm -hmm. for opportunity. That has a cost or an expense to it, whether it's in a qualified account or a non-qualified account. There's another mm -hmm. expense we have to take into account because if you keep trading all day long in an IRA or a qualified account, no tax on that. That's fine. But if you're doing it in a non-qualified account, guess what happens? You did a show a little while ago talking about loser funds that I'm getting a tax bill on at mm -hmm. the end of the year. It's exactly what we're talking about. Well, let's, right just, let's just clean that up for a second here. Yeah. In 2015, from August to the end of the year, is a bad scene. Most Americans in mutual funds and, in, unfortunately, even in ETFs, ETFs yeah. we took a hit. We yep. took a hit. But you don't really see the hit in taxation until you get to non-qualified monies, which is, of course, not in your traditional retirement accounts. All right. Clients got an end-of-the-year statement showing they had losses on their mutual funds and their ETFs. And it was bad. Correct. But a week later, Ted, they get a 1099 from the same fund that says, hey, you owe taxes. What the heck happened here? What the heck happened there was, as you know, what a mutual fund is or an ETF, it's just a group of individual stocks, mm -hmm. whether there's 50 or 500 of them in there. And what happens is the overall investment, the mutual fund, could have lost money that year. But inside of that mutual fund, certain stocks made money that year. Mm -hmm. The performance was pretty good. So now we're getting a loss on our mutual fund, but we're getting a tax bill for some of the gains that happened mm -hmm. inside of it. It doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. And the public, I've been talking about this for 35 years. I mean, but here's something I want you to think about this. If you're watching this show and it's still on this side of the year, if we're, we're broadcasting, we're recording in 2017, you need to talk to your advisor or guys like Ted or Ted himself. You need to talk to these guys about tax harvesting 
non-qualified mutual funds to your losers and winners so that you can manage and mitigate your tax bill. This is so important. I, I say it every year and everybody goes, what happened in, in January? We'll be in seminars and everybody will be weeping. It'll That's be right. really a tough deal. Listen, don't forget to watch our next segment on the truth about your IRA, part two in our series on retirement tips for seniors. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money, The Name of the Game. Yeah.